afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kimberly Cheek, and I'm the Associate Department Head of Humanities. And I would like to welcome you to um, the celebration of Women's History Month. Um, today, um, we have the pleasure of hearing Miss Mary Williams. Um, I was actually very excited when I was asked to introduce Mary today. Um, because Mary is, of course, um, one of the adjuncts here at Wake Tech. I've had the pleasure of knowing her. Um, and it, I am just excited about hearing what she's going to share with us today. Um, Mary is a gospel singer. She is also an educator. And she is also a historian. And Mary has transformed lives. And she's still transforming lives with her music. So today, we're going to hear from Mary and her music. Thank you. They say that freedom is a constant struggle. North Carolina. 
Harriet was a young lady that was a beautiful in terms of her features. She was willed to her, the, her uh, owners, willed to their children. When she was willed to them, the, um, the child, um, one of the children was so infatuated with her that he began very early on to abuse her physically and sexually. Harriet Jacobs left um, Edenton and went and found refuge at her grandmother's attic, which was a small, very small compartment. She lived in that hiding place, which was actually one block from the enslaved plantation where her grandmother and others were enslaved. What she ended up doing was living there for almost seven years in that portal. She tried to get her um, family members and others to buy her children out of freedom. As a free black, black woman, her grandmother was living there in Edenton and was trying to work out as much as she could for her daughter, to her granddaughter, to be free. According to her autobiography, which she learned to read and write much later, and began to write down her experience here as a North Carolinian. Her book or autobiography is entitled Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. It was published as early on as 1861. She lived in a crawl space at her grandmother's home. Seven years, she escaped so many that would come there each and every day looking for her because the slave master was desperate that she remain enslaved. It, after those seven years, she had stayed, escaped, and many of you that may know this, is that North Carolina, our maritime, our all along our inner um, inlet, in terms of waterways, was also an escape route for the Underground Railroad. And that's how she actually escaped. She was legally free, but it took 10 years for her to even gain her freedom. She, at that time, once she got free, she began to be called, call herself a freedom seeker. She was an anti-slavery activist and an abolitionist and, of course, an author. By the time of the Civil War, African-American women like Jacob served as relief workers. They dedicated themselves to assisting newly free people out of the South, but particularly here in North Carolina. Women impacted so many lives. After emancipation, they began to re-identify themselves. Because now, as a free woman, imagine this, that if you've been enslaved for multiple years and not knowing with, um, how to do things unless you've been dictated to or being told what to do, and then to be on your own after emancipation, how do you manage? How do you manage that? Church groups, specifically women's groups, such as the um, Sunshine Band and many other organizations, began to come together and teach African American women, and these are women in history, that how to manage their homes, how to socialize, how to go out into the world and maneuver as a free individual. Sojourner Truth. African American woman committed to the human rights and active slavery. She was a soldier. Now, I need you to participate, so y'all want me to just keep it looking at you. All right? This is a real easy song, and I need you to join in now. Dwight, I'm depending on y'all. All right? I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a
activism. She joined um, Olive Gilbert, which was a white feminist, and in collaborative publications, the narrative of Sojourner Truth was published in Boston in 1850. It was in 1851 that she stood up in front of people. Now understand this, these are not educated women. These are self-taught. Frederick Douglass, what did he do? He actually fed students food for them to teach him how to write. Did they know they were teaching him? No. He would ask them to show them how to write an A. He just show me how that how that's done. And he learned how to write through that those means of deception. Many of them did the same thing. There was no school for them. In fact, it was illegal to educate them. It was in 1851 that she stood at a women's rights meeting in Akron, Ohio, and delivered, aren't I a woman? It's a speech that she delivered. This speech embedded in her image, in her mind, uh, in, the, in the mind of even other white feminists of that time. So Journal Truth rose in the minds of many great leaders, and as she would often say, and this is her quote, she said, God himself told me and talked to me what and told me what to do. Where others may obtain their knowledge from books and other things, she declared that God gave her insight, the insight that she needed to help the enslaved go free. During the Civil War, she worked tirelessly on so many issues, working to desegregate streetcars in Washington, D.C. In 1864, she herself was presented to counsel and speak with President Abraham Lincoln. She also, through Abraham Galloway, right here in Wilmington, North Carolina, recruited soldiers recruited spies to get information from the Confederate Army. During this particular time, anybody that was not a Confederate soldier was pretty much put to death. In Kinston, North Carolina, when the general came through Kinston, North Carolina during the war, he wanted every Caucasian, what he called a true blood, what he called real blood, to join the Confederacy. What ended up happening during that time? 21 young men said, I will not join the Confederacy. Uh -huh. I will not do it. Now, how many of you are familiar with Kinston? Raise your hand. Uh, let's see, where can you tell me about Kinston? Yeah, talk to me. It's near the beach. It's near the beach. What else about Kinston do y'all know? Yes, sir. Uh, the North Community College is located. OK, OK. Now, what else about Kinston? Yes, sir. Uh, Jerry Stackhouse is okay. Okay, that's a good thing to know. <laughs> anyway, okay, that's good. Anything else? Kinston is small. It's little. Even today, I was not there. That I was there not that long ago, and the um, the, the numbers are very. They don't have that many people. On the day the general came in, and he was deterred by these white gentlemen, young men, very young men, who would not join the Confederacy. He hung 21 of them in Kinston, North Carolina, because they wouldn't join the Confederate Army. That's North Carolina. He hung everyone. Now, that was just about everybody's son or cousin in Kinston. Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, a writer, a poet, lectured on the importance of racial reconciliation, urging the idea of social and economic uplift. Women that are contributing to our history, but yet some of them not even mentioned. African American women that made their pledge that they were fighting for their rights and they uh, uh, submitted themselves to it being as an army. That's why they took some of these songs that were literally brought up during the during, um, slave narrative 
while they were enslaved. Some of these songs were never penned. They were just passed down. As she began to encourage people through her words, she was encouraging them to advance themselves in and through education. January 31st, 1861, she stood in Philadelphia at a, uh, at a podium at a social, civil, and statistical association of the colored people of Philadelphia and offered a lecture in Philadelphia's National Hall. This was arranged by William Steele, the Christian Recorder, which was a magazine and, I'm sorry, newspaper, said that the audience, both colors, were in attendance. That's how they wrote things in those days. Both colors were there. The listeners were heard, hard pressed on the issues of now the Civil War has ended and we're in this era, my students know all about this, the era of reconstruction. The, the, the different speakers began to talk about that they were afraid that the 14th Amendment um, would be ratified. They were afraid that other things, that battles that continue to ensue, they were afraid because of racial discrimination. They were afraid because the bylaws of the Ku Klux Klan um, was really hinged on the fact that African American men were as beasts or vultures swooping down on white women. She stood at the podium and began to talk about this ongoing battle. They could have had so many things on their mind, but one of the things that she began to press as she spoke was that the North and the South heartily reconcile and fully become one again, politically and socially. Frederick Douglass was there. He stood, and as he spoke, he linked African American rights to that of women's rights as he stood in front of a packed house. This is his quote Drive no man from the ballot box because of his color, and keep no woman from it on account of her sex. End of quote. Frederick Douglass. She began to write things. We are all bound up together. She noted that it was a tremendous, she was a tremendous orator, and many of them began to let her put her on the same platform in terms of the greatness of the oration of Frederick Douglass. They felt that she was that great of an orator. She used her character, her rhythms and poetry her rhetorical strategies to make a presentation. But just as some songs were used the same way during the Civil Rights Movement and during the Civil War, she and Tim used words in poetry. But they would sing songs that came and were lifted up from the Old Testament scriptures. I wanna be
Now this song is really easy, we're gonna speed it up. But I wanna be ready. I wanna be ready. I wanna be ready to walk in Jerusalem just like John. Real easy, keep clapping. Alright, let's try walk in Jerusalem. Walk in Jerusalem just like John. Let's do it again. Walk in Jerusalem just like John. Come on, let's try again one more time. Here we go. Walk in Jerusalem just like John. Good, now. I want to be ready. Keep clapping. I want to be ready. I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem just like Many of the plantation owners, 
I know my mom's parents, there were 12 of them that farmed. And so my father, my grandfather, Jesse Dobbin, my grandfather was a farmer. That was a lifestyle, particularly here in North Carolina. And it wasn't a lot of hiring in terms of going out getting workers, but the family took the role of taking care of how things were to go. This is a little town in Florida that she's talking to her granddaughter and trying to explain such as my mother tried to tell me, I don't know if there's any African-American girl in here or Caucasian, whatever the race or culture, whose mom had tried to steer you in a better direction. I know as a parent, I want my children to really enhance have a life that was better than mine. That's the objective, right? Everybody know that's the goal. So she wanted her granddaughter to have a better way of life. She looked far beyond, looking for a great day, as she called it, where things would be different. Maybe not in her lifetime, maybe not in the lifetime of the grandmother, but surely it's a possibility in the lifetime of her granddaughter. She counted herself as shedding some light to protect her granddaughter. But this is what she tells her granddaughter. And this is in um, black dialogue, dialect, during this particular time. She said, honey, the white man is the ruler of everything as far as I have been able to find out. Now maybe it's someplace way off in the ocean where the black man is in power. But we don't know nothing about that because we can't see that fur. But, and she uses the N word, I'm not going to do that, but she said, the black woman is the mule, M-U-L-E, of this old world, as fur as I can see. In the world. She talks about the black woman, the Negro woman, the African American woman, being the mule of this world, as far as she can see. The beast of birth, the navigator, the mover, the problem solver. When things don't go right, because understand, during this era in terms of history, we understand and know that many African American women had no protection, particularly during slavery and specifically during Reconstruction, because if their husbands or their uh, their spouses or whatever tried to protect them, the husband could be killed or murdered or rich or worse. That's something to think about, isn't it? During this particular time, we understand that women were moving and doing what they could to contribute. Many would have lost their children. They could not find their husbands. They had been married on plantations and we're still seeking to find. See, nobody thinks about that. The fact that even though that re reconstruction is happening and things of people family are free, where are my children? Where is my husband? Lord, what?
57. Okay. 157. Okay, so that's right. This woman's class has gathered in her hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So before, let's see. Let me do, I'm going to do a little different this time. All right, well, in dedication to him, and then I'll flip right back and we'll end it.
ready for the next hour. We're moving on. Everybody all right? Yes. All right. Had to get that out. Marion Anderson. Marion Anderson stood on the steps of the, the Lincoln Memorial. And in so doing, she was told by the daughters of the American Revolution that she could not sing in Constitution Hall because of the color of her skin. She went about her business, she had sang for kings and queens, but could not sing in Constitution Hall for the president. It was because of Eleanor Roosevelt's resignation from the DAR that really urged the world to take a look at what was going on. But even in that, even in her resignation, even in something so powerful a statement, they still wouldn't let her into the door. So what they did as a compromise, they stood her on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And she and all of her eloquent, eloquent eloquence, beauty, and she was trained, I'm not trained, she's a trained singer, opera singer. She stood on those steps, and even though she never said a word of introduction, she gave them a political press by singing just a few of these songs. He got the whole in his hands, he's got the whole wide world. In his hands, the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. Come on, y'all know this. He's got everybody here. In his hands, he's got the world.
Nina Simone was born in Tryon, North Carolina. She was a tremendous activist, politically active with her voice. She was born there. I had the honor of dedicating the home where she was born in Tryon, North Carolina. In fact, I think my son AJ was, was with me during that. He, um, sometimes my children would travel with me. And uh, we were there dedicating the house as a historic site. People today, I'm talking 2024, travel from Paris and Rome and other places to see where Nina Simone was born. There's a statue in the heart of town with her seated at a keyboard. The mayor explained to me that he said, Ms. Williams, I've been, we're so embarrassed because when people come from other countries and other parts of the world to see Nina Simone where she was birthed, we have nothing to show them, a dilapidated home. He said, we're not done well. So we were there to raise money and there were contributors to make her home a historic site. Before she became such a tremendous, magnificent pianist, she just played by ear because it was God's gift to her. Her mother was an evangelist. And she would travel with her mother here in North Carolina rendering her Bibles. And so she would say, and this is the song, you pull her up, she still would sing this song at concerts, no matter where she was, even in other countries. Take me to the
Name us among our consciousness by moving people emotionally. Encouraging them even sometimes at marches to go where I send thee. How shall I send thee? In my closing, I think I'm ready to close. This yeah, 20, yeah. We got, oh, I got 124. Okay, okay. I want to get you on. I want them to fire me. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. She marched with Martin Luther King in South Alabama, the March in Washington. She was in awe of Martin Luther King. She felt encouraged that he had um, that he had lived and that he would one day, which, which was for her own, that he would one day run for the presidency of these United States. After his death, she wrote, King of Love is dead. His death, she said, it feels as if someone has killed me and killed the inspiration of the civil rights movement. She was pushing forward in her music to make an impact. I wish I knew not really how it feels to be. Take it back to the name of King and not leave it right there. I wish I could rest all the chains holding me. Yeah. I wish I could say all the things that I should say. Say I'm alive. And in that sense of security, when her 
mother died, her father started had another relationship, and I continue to research it because there's some references or sources that basically are saying that they weren't married anyway. And so during this time, you know that she had to be ridiculed and called names because she didn't have a father that was married to her mother. So that was a problem within itself. She leaves New Orleans and goes to Chicago with her aunt because they feel that that's the best thing to do. When she goes, she has no idea. Remember when I talked to you about Zorno Hurston and what the mother and grandmother was saying that as far as I can see. As far as her aunts could see, as far as Mahalia could see, is that all she would do when she shifted and moved to Chicago was clean houses or take care of children, or do white laundry. Nothing, because if you don't see it, you can't reach for it. If you had not seen anybody do it, you don't know it can be done. I talked to my Aunt Wilma, she's 97, I think, today, if I'm not mistaken. And I talked to her, and she explained to me that when Aunt Wilma, um, she was saying that during the era in that time, we didn't know no black doctors and no black lawyers and no black nobody. She said, we just call the preacher. If one of the children got in trouble, we call the preacher. Somebody was losing their home and had to gather funds and get the folk together, they called the preacher. Because she didn't know, they didn't know who to call other than him. So the what she and not what she knew. Her aunt was a seems, her aunt was a, a laundress, that's what they call her, and cleaned homes. That's what all of her aunts did. So she went to Chicago with that in mind. When she got there, she was so overwhelmed. The first thing that shocked her mind was is that when she got off the train and stepped onto the street to get ready to go to the apartment, her aunt said, summons for a cab driver. She almost fainted. Because when the cab driver was summoned, he pulls up and he is quiet. She had never known an African American person to summons anyone that wasn't of their own race to do anything. She was stunned. So her aunt began to show her around and she did get jobs on the laundry. She got a job in a hotel cleaning rooms. She would go to church because she said that she was in a place that she just wasn't where she felt she needed to be. Sometimes I feel like
y'all for coming.